Thank you very much. Let's discuss this now with Lisa Fisher, Senior Policy Advisor at the Climate Change Think Tank E3G, and Bob Ward, Policy and Communications Director at the Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and the Environment, which is at the London School of Economics. Um, Lisa and Bob, thank you both for coming in. Welcome to you. Um, huge number of people in uh, Madrid, which at least reflects how current this debate is and how much governments want to kind of be involved in making the decisions. How much of that, though, would you say is defensive, that they don't want to end up in a situation where they feel they are doing too much and letting other countries off the hook? Well, I, the main thing here is that these delegates meet every year. This is an ongoing process, and this year is critical in trying to finish off the so-called Paris rule book, which is a set of ways of implementing the crucial Paris Agreement that everybody signed up to in 2015. But we're starting on an absolutely critical year where countries are expected over the next 12 months to bring forward revised pledges for national action that are more ambitious. We already know that what's currently on the table is not sufficient to limit uh, global warming to safe levels and they're supposed to put on the table revised more ambitious pledges ahead of the next summit which will actually take place in Glasgow this time next year. And I think it's important to um, also observe the shift that's been happening. I think increasingly many countries are seeing that it is actually in their self-interest to act on climate. In China for example combating coal coincides actually with protecting people's health, people's lives but I think we're not there yet and I think there's quite a lot governments need to do to think about what happens if we don't act. What does that mean for our citizens, for our, for our citizens' lives? Because I suppose the worry in some countries would be, look, if, if other countries don't act with sufficient vigour, then we'll end up with even tougher targets that the rest of us have to meet. And that's when you might in, encounter a bit of popular resistance in the sense that people don't feel there's kind of a fairness to how this process is carried out. I mean, Bob, how do you address that fairness question? Is it fair, for example, that countries that are just becoming to the first rank of development status, who are getting to the stage of doing all the industrial things we've done for the last 200 years, are then told, no, sorry, you can't do it. We've decided it's not good for the planet. We've had the benefits. You won't get the opportunity. I think the debate has moved on a little bit from that because the impacts of climate change are now visible all around the world and the poor countries recognize that they are most vulnerable to these impacts so the argument is not we shouldn't act it's that they expect rightly in my view that the rich countries do more mainly because they have historic responsibility for the emissions that have got us where we are today but secondly that they are rich enough to take action not just at home but also support action abroad Lisa, I mean in terms of practical measures that you can persuade people to adopt, even if, let's say, national governments in the US don't do it, they're the cities, they're the states, they have quite a lot of power too. Is it possible to get that buy-in, that public buy-in for, for these kinds of actions, which may come at a personal price, a personal cost, to individual voters and consumers, however, and, and indeed mm -hmm. producers of goods and services? I think that the US example that you're mentioning is one that really shows us where the problem of climate action lies. Cities, um, states in the US are taking action because we have the technologies, we have the ideas, we have the solutions. It is a political pro problem after all. I think there is a responsibility on governments to think this through, to take the first um, steps mm -hmm. and also of course to, to support people in making the right choices. So take the example of food choices, should we go vegetarian or vegan, that's a life debate in the UK. Governments have the responsibility to support people in making the right choices for the planet, but also in terms of their energy choices at home, how do they heat their homes, this can't only be borne by the individual. And in terms of that, there's a good example uh, in the UK Finance Minister or the Chancellor of the Exchequer's budget speech earlier in the year when he was talking about setting a date beyond which it won't be possible to put in boilers, that something that people have relied on for 80, 90 years in this country as the way to heat their, many of their homes, suddenly that's going to be gone and that's government that's made that decision and that will come at a cost. Well it requires an investment but 
your older viewers will remember that we used to have something called town gas, which was the old style methane that came mm. out of coal beds. And the country had a national upgrading program that brought it in. And that's what we need now, because people can see here as well, we're having the impacts of climate change. We've had examples of flooding. We had record heat waves this summer. So people can see it's happening and they accept that there is got to be an upfront investment which will have long-term returns but they do want it to be fair they don't want to see well i'm doing my bit but companies are not doing their bit they also want the u.s to start acting and i think it will be a bit hard for people to think this week if boris johnson doesn't tackle donald trump about climate change now, now that's an interesting conversation i'd like to be a fly on the wall for lisa in terms of the experience that for example, is already a case in, in Europe. Obviously, we're leaving the structures of the European Union. But uh, what has happened within Europe in terms of that way of sharing the burden? Yeah, I'm, I, I assume you're referring also to what's happening in France and mm. the Yellow West protests that happened after Macron introduced um, um, rises in carbon prices or in, in fuel prices. In other words, to make fuel um, for cars and vehicles yeah. more expensive. But I, I think it's very important mm. to look at the context here. Very briefly before, he cut income taxes. So if you look at the fairness across the system, of course people react and of course people think that's not fair. We're cutting income taxes on the one hand, but we're bear bearing the bo burden of higher costs of consumption. So we have to look at it, at it in the round. I think in the UK next year we have an opportunity. We will be looking at government spending, we will be talk talking carbon budgets. So there's re a real opportunity to bring those conversations together and make it fair all across. Lisa Fisher, Bob Ward, thank you both very much for coming to talk to us this evening. I know you'll be following events with great interest in Madrid, so perhaps we'll get the chance to talk again. Thank you both.